Hello, Great Tours. My name is Joyce Mothakwane, and welcome to today's lesson. We basically going to be talking about our final exam preparation, where we will be doing questions together. So get your pen, your paper, and your calculator. Let's get into the lesson. Right. So just a reminder of our levels. Please, this coming slides, make sure that you go back to the exam guide uh, lesson. That's where you will get a detailed explanation of the levels and the action verbs. Do make sure that you go watch that video. So the levels, we've got level one, that will give us about 45 marks, knowledge questions, and we've got level two, routine procedures, just small calculations. It's going to be also about 45 marks. Then we've got level three, that's where we take it a step further and we do multi-step calculations, more than two steps. It will give you about 30 marks, plus or minus 30 marks. And then you've got questions where you need to reason and reflect on what you are given. It's going to be about 30 marks. Those are your levels uh, in that order from uh, the easy ones to the most difficult ones. Action verbs to look out for, it's not all of them. You will find some of these action verbs in your questions. You might be asked to analyze, it means to separate, it means to interpret. You might be asked to calculate, that's where we're looking for a numerical answer. Of course, do show us your calculations. We have classify, where you need to give us the common characteristics that you, you, you see They group them in, the, in those terms. You've got compare, that's where you need to give us the similarities or the differences. You can be asked to define, that is to give us a clear meaning of that word that you would be given. You can be asked to describe, that is give us a word for word explanation of that concept. Determine or determine, that means to calculate something or to discover based on the evidence given. Discuss, you're going to have to uh, consider all the information that you're given and make a conclusion. Differentiate, you're using differences uh, to give us difference from one uh, thing to another. Explain, you give us a clear interpretation of what is asked. Identifying, it means to single out something based on its characteristics. You will be asked to list uh, just give us those items without any additional information. You might be asked to name. We just want a proper noun, that name that you will be uh, given there, maybe provinces or anything that can be asked. You can be asked to state uh, something you need to be writing down with no further explanations, suggesting you offer us an explanation or a solution. So those are the few action verbs that you might come across as we continue with our questions. Now, let's get started. I hope you are ready. You have everything ready to do the calculations together. Let's look at our question one. Remember, question one, it's supposed to have only level one questions. Here's one example. It says the price of two types of blenders, two types of blenders, are given below. All prices exclude VAT. We know now that our VAT, um, uh, VAT percentage is 15%. So you have the information. So remember what we said, you need to go analyze your information. You've got normal price, discount. You go look at them. For both the blenders, you are given important information like your 15% VAT. What kind of questions can they ask in this concept? Let's look at one. It says, use the information provided to answer the following questions or the questions that follow. Write out the acronym VAT or VET in full. Now you notice here they're talking about the acronym. Acronym means what? It means the abbreviation. So we need you to go and tell us what VET stands for. Ah, I can see you already have the answer. Yes, you are correct is the value added tax. Remember, if they ask you to define it, then you need to go in detail to tell us that is that tax that is charged, you know, be specific on what kind of tax uh, you're talking about. But here, 
we just want to uh, spell out that acronym. Okay, moving along, another question they might ask you to write down the discount. Write down, it means exactly that. You're just going to write down. No calculations necessary. So they're saying we should write down the discount amount. Let's go back to our table and look for discount. But for which blender? For blender number one. Yes, I can see that you already have the answer. You just go to that discount that is given there. You take it from the table, you put it down in your answer sheet, and you get two marks for that. How much is the discount? Yes, 200 rands is our discount. So that is how you can go about answering those questions that don't require you to do a lot of calculations. Your keywords are very important because if you understand what it means to write down, you're not going to go looking for values to subtract or add or looking for weights. Right. The next question they might ask is calculate the value of A, the normal price of for Blender 2. You go to Blender 2, you look for what? You look for normal price. Here is normal price. Ah, it's not given. How do we find that normal price? We know the normal price is the price before the discount. So it means these two values are going to play a role in your calculation. The question you might ask yourself is that do I add or do I subtract? Yes, you're correct. You're going to add your two values. Let's see. So you have 259 plus 41 rents. So 259, you add that to 41 rents. How much did you get there? I got 300. I hope you also got 300 rents. Yes, I hope my handwriting is clear there by you. Okay, let us now move right along. <clears throat> Another question they might give you is to now to determine, remember determine, you can find that by examining the information or you can calculate. Determine the difference. In maths literacy, difference means subtract in most of the times, but they can also ask you what is the difference. Then you need to say something about the two things you are given. The difference between the new price of Blender 1 and the new price for Blender 2. Let's go find our new prices. Blender 1, our new price is $5.99. Blender 2, our new price is $2.59. What are we going to do? We're going to subtract the two values. Then we're going to have 599 minus 259. Let us press that in our calculators and get the answer. The error that some of you make here is to take the small value and subtract the big value. So you will have 259 minus uh, 599 and you give us the positive value. Please make sure that your calculation is correct so that you get your marks in full. Yes, now let us calculate that. Pressing your calculators, 599 minus 259 rents, and then you get your answer. Yes, the answer is 340 rents. And that's it. Finance question, level ones, easy. There's a lot, uh, great talks. Remember to go and visit other or look at other question papers to get confidence in this question one. All right, let's go to another question. This one is data handling. It says 361,948 candidates who wrote mathematical literacy paper one in 2016. The paper had a total of 150 marks and candidates had three hours to complete the paper. The graph below shows the average percentage mark per question for this paper. So we are looking to find average percentage. We are looking to find uh, question numbers. Let's see. Here is our graph. We're going to use this graph to answer the questions that follow. So question one up until question five with the percentages there on top of each uh, bar. First question, name the type of graph, the type of graph used to represent the data. Yes, we can see that it's a bar graph, but we need to be specific which one. 
In this case, it is a vertical bar graph. Go and revise other types of graphs in case they can give you a compound graph, you will know which type of graph you are working with. The second question, it says that we must express the number of candidates who wrote this paper in words. Write it in full. Let's see, you have 361,948. How do we write that down? Yes, I know you know how to write it. Make sure that you get the spelling right and you indicate for us that is candidate. So they just want you to write the numbers in full, not as numerical values, but as weights. So candidates at the end, if you're talking about rents, you also write in 58 rents, just as an example. Two marks, level one, we are good to go. Right, so the next question there says we must identify. What are we supposed to identify? The question in which the candidates obtained the second lowest. Not the lowest, but the second lowest. So if you were to uh, arrange your data in ascending order, meaning you start from the smallest or from the lowest, that number we're looking for will be the one that comes just after the lowest value. And in this case, we can see that the lowest is 40, but that's not our answer. We're looking for the second lowest, and there we go, it's 44. 44 is question number, aha, you got it right, question number five. So that's what the question was asking you to do, just to identify that question number five, but using the correct uh, way of finding it, the second lowest. Okay, so far so good. So we are going to go to question number two, finance. Remember, all the levels can be assessed in this question, so you can't run away from verify. Let's see what we have as an example here of finance. It says there that Aaron bought a house in 2018. She decided to draw up a loan model, a loan, ah, okay for the duration of the loan period as shown in Annexure A. Some information has been omitted. So we can expect to find some blanks there. Use the information in Annexure A to answer the questions below. So let's go look at what Annexure A has. Yes, so that is a, the account statement for the duration of the loan. When they tell you to note, please note, it's very important that you go and read what the note says because most of the time that note has a piece of information that can be very useful in your calculations. So we have our months there, the opening balance, the loan amount, the interest, the balance with interest, and also the closing balance. Let's see what they want us to do. The first question there says we must define the term interest rate. What is interest rate in this context? We know what is interest rate. Is that a percentage of uh, the, the, the principal amount that you have to pay extra. But in this context, what are we talking about? Loans. So when taking a what? When taking out a loan, that is the money that you need to pay, but in terms of a rate, in terms of percentage, not in terms of a monetary value, because they're saying interest rate, not interest amount. So be sure to differentiate between the two. So there's an example that I have for you. So the percentage of the principal amount charged for borrowing money, but specifically for taking out a home loan in this context that we're talking about. I hope it makes sense. Let's go and see what else they can ask us. They say there that we must calculate the closing balance, not uh, the, the, the one at the end, but the one of three months. Let's go and look for three months. There is our three months. We are now looking at this part. But as you notice that we don't have the value here, but what we're looking for is here under closing balance. How do I work out this value at the end while I don't have this amount? Let's look there. So the opening balance is 749,299.39. The interest charged is 6,088.06. Then the balance with the interest, what does it mean? What do we need to do? 
we need to take those two values at, and add them up. So we need to take 749, uh, 299 and 39, and then at the interest that they charged this uh, person here, it's 6088,06. And then we get the value there. Now we're looking for the, the balance with interest inside. Let's go to our calculators and let's press that amount. So it's 7. 49, 299 and 39 cents plus 6,088 rands and 6 cents. What do we get there? We get a value of, yes, yeah, so we get 755,000 387 and 45 cents. Three, let's go write it down. It's 755,387 rands and 45 cents. Now from here, we're going to take out the repayment that uh, the owner made. So we're going to say subtract 6,442 rents and 50 cents, and then you get your answer at the end. So press your calculators and give me the answer there, right? So we're not going to write it down, but I am sure you have it there on your calculators. But something to take off note, uh, grade 12, so look at your, your, your interest column. As you notice that as the month continues, your interest goes down. Notice there by 300 months, the interest is very low, but the repayment is still the same. But look at the first payment. It's 6,093, and the owner will be paying 6,422. Do you notice that a lot of the money that the owner pays goes towards interest? So with a home loan, you only start paying for your actual bond after a lot of months. Initially, you will be paying interest and interest. And so if you pay the, the, the repayments, if you make them more, it is actually going to decrease those interest and you will end up uh, reducing uh, your, the, loan, the, the, the term loan or even the value that you were supposed to pay in interest. So take note of that if you are planning to buy a house one day. All right, now how do they calculate those um, monthly repayments? There they say the bank uses the following home loan factor table to calculate the monthly repayments on home loans. Use table two to show how the monthly repayment of 6,442 rents and 50 cents on extra A was calculated. Take note, they say the factor used depends on the number of years and the interest rate. That is a guide enough to show you that you're going to be focusing on the number of years and the interest. Let's quickly go remind ourselves what, are, what is the loan amount. This is the loan amount. This is the interest rate that uh, the owner is paying towards the house. And these are the number of years. So it's 30, 000, uh, sorry, 30 years and 9,75 percentage. Let's go. 30 years, we go down with it. Then we go to 9,75 percent. We go to the right with it. Then we coming from up down. There we end. So this is your loan factor. In other words, in this formula that you are given down here, the, 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 the monthly repayments, you will say the loan amount. How much is the loan amount? The loan amount is 750,000. 750,000, then you go into, what are you going to do? You're going to divide it by 1,000, and then you multiply it by the loan factor. How much is the loan factor? 8,59, and then you will get your you will, get your, you will get your answer there from there onwards. The answer is definitely going to give you 6,442 rents and 50. 
The answer doesn't have marks, uh, grade 12. Your step has all the marks, so be sure to get everything correct at the top there. Okay, just to give you a little brief on this one where you need to verify. The friend just wants to show Aaron something. The friend says uh, that after the 119th repayment, she will already have paid 15,000 more than the original home uh, loan amount. Verify showing calculations. So here we are recalculating. So we're going to say uh, 199 repayments. How much is this person paying per month? The person is paying 6,442 and 50 cents. Then we get the value there. Let's press our calculators. Right, so we are going to multiply. We're going to say 119 repayments multiplied by 6,442 rands and 50 cents. Then how much do we get? We get 766,659.50. Six Let's go write it. So it's 766,659, 6, 657 rents and 50 cents. So this is how much the friend uh, is saying Alvin would have paid. But let's see if indeed this person had paid 15,000 more. How much is uh, the home loan? Initially, it was 750,000, but the person paid 766,657.50. cents. So let us then subtract the two amounts. Let me get my eraser. So we're going to say 766,657 rents 50 minus 750,000, then we get the amount. So we will say, oh, that value, 766,657 rents 50, subtract 750,000. Then we get how much? We get 16,000. 657, so it's 16,657 and 50 cents. Look at this and look at what the friend said. Indeed, the friend is correct. So the statement is valid. Aaron would have paid more than 15,000 uh, on top of what uh, she was supposed to pay had she not taken the loan, had she paid the house cash. All right, boys and girls, great tops. We're going to take a short break and then we'll come back and look at the kind of questions that we can expect to find in question three. See you right after this. <music> Welcome back grade 12 to our lesson. Let's go right into question three and see what kind of questions we can expect. So it's data handling. What can we expect from level one to level four? This is just one of the examples. It says there, swimming lessons are offered four times a week to three different groups, the morning group and the afternoon group A. Each has 20 registered participants. The evening group E has only eight ne, registered participants. Annexure C shows the attendance records for the three groups over a period of 18 days, as well as corresponding box and whisker plots representing the attendance of groups M and A. Let's go see our diagrams. There is your records, morning, afternoon, and evening. Day one up until day 18 for each. And then you have a box and whisker only for the morning group and the 
afternoon groups. So what questions should we or can we expect from this uh, section? It says determine the missing value B if the mean attendance M is 15. We are so used to being given the mean, uh, we are so used to being given the, 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 the question to ask the, the, the mean or the question to calculate the, the median and find the range. We forget that sometimes they can give us the mean and ask us to find the missing value. What is the first thing that we need to do? Remember your concept of the mean. What is the mean? The mean, you take all the values in your data set, you add them up, and then you divide them by the total number of uh, those uh, amounts there. If it's 18 days, you're going to divide by 18. So this is what we should be having as our start. Your mean is equals to all the numbers added up divided by the total number of days. So your 20, don't forget to add the B. So take your calculator and add all these values up. 20 plus 18 plus, don't uh, be impatient, add them up correctly. Then you will get what? you will get 236. What is your mean? The mean is given as 15. You write it down as it is. What is B plus B? It's 2B. So you have 15 is equals to 236 plus 2B. All of that amount, both of those at the top divided by 18. Now, how do you get two to B? You need to work from the division part onwards, right? Now, what I usually tell my learners is that because we run away from mathematics for different reasons, let us make it easy. If you see a division line, then it means that value that you have there, you need to take it and multiply it with the value that is on the other side. The opposite of division is what? Multiplication. So you will then say 15 multiplied by 18. How much is 15 multiplied by 18? 15 multiplied by 18 is, let's use our manual calculator. Uh, 15 plus, uh, sorry, 15 multiplied by 18. We get how much? We get 270. Now that 270, we're going to equate it to 236 plus 2. B plus 2B. Then how do we remove a number that was added on the, 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 the right-hand side? How do I then take it to the other side? I will subtract it on the other side. The opposite of addition is subtraction. So you will say 270 minus 236. And then you will remain with 2B on the other side. So take your calculator, subtract uh, 236 from that 270. And then you get what? You get 34. So you have 34 is equals to 2B. Remember initially we said we remove a division line by multiplication. It means we remove a multiplication by what? Exactly, by division. So I'm going to divide both sides by 3, 4 or 34. What is a... Sorry, we're going to divide both sides rather by 2. I want to remove 2, not 34. Now you remember we said we are removing uh, division by multiplication. We're going to remove multiplication by division. So we're going to divide both sides by 2. So 2 will cancel 2. Then what is 34 divided by 2? 34 divided by 2, it's 17. So it means your B is equal to 17. Each B will be 17 uh, and 17. So you can go through this uh, at your own spare time. You can just rewind if you did not follow through very well. But just take note that this is one of the approaches that you can take. There are many ways. Some usually cross multiply the values. Others just work through them step by step without using the equal sign in between. So anything that works for you to manipulate your formula, it's the best method that will help you get that A. So this is what I found very helpful uh, to use. Okay, now we are reasoning. We are going level four. It says give a possible reason why E has full attendance on more days than M. 
Here your answers are going to be different, but you need to be logical. Look at the information that you're given to see what could be a possible reason. In the morning, we know that usually people go to work. In the evening, people are relaxed. So in other words, you can list a reason from this one here. Convenience. It's more convenient for them to go in the evenings or there are many distractions that uh, might keep us away uh, to go and get these lessons during the, 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 the morning part of the day. So any valid reason that you can think of, it needs to make sense, it needs to be according to the context that you are given. You might also be asked to determine the probability expressed as a whole percentage rounding here, it's important, of randomly choosing a day on which A has full attendance. So we're going to go look for full attendance. Just a reminder that probability is something over something, meaning what I desire uh, to have over the total number of items that are listed there. So 20 days, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So I've got six of those days where I have a full attendance. Out of how many days? We said it's 18 days out of 18. Because they say percentage, we multiply that value by 100. So you say six divided by 18, the answer you get, you multiply it by 100. Then the answer that you get there, it's 33,33%. They said whole percentage. So we can say what? We can say approximately because 3, 3 there, it's less than 5. That 3 after the decimal is less than 5. So we're going to round it to 33%. So about 33, estimated 33% of uh, the days, that's where now you get what? You get full attendance. Okay. Box and whisker now. So many questions can be asked under box and whisker. You can be asked to find the five number summary, your minimum, the beginning of your box and whisker. Maximum, the end. Quartile number one, quartile number two, quartile number three. You can be asked a lot out of this question, but the ones that they want us to find out now is to give two reasons why the attendance of A is considered to be better than that of M by using the box and whisker. So already they told us that it is better. All we need to say is why are we saying it's better? So what do we usually use to compare in our box and whiskers? You use anything from the minimum value that you have. You use mainly, we, we find ourselves using the interquartile range. So the interquartile range has to be smaller and the median has to be bigger than the other group. Then we can say that group has performed better in terms of maybe marks. In this case, we're talking about uh, the attendance, you see? So these are the possible answers that you can give. Right here, they did not say we should calculate. So it's a matter of just saying which uh, is which. So the range of the afternoon group is smaller. If the range is smaller, it's a good indication. We don't want our, our, our data to be widespread. We want it to be, you know, consistent uh, to that, uh, the spread of data. If maybe we're talking about marks, if the, the range is, is, is a lot, it means that there's a huge difference when it comes to the marks. You know, you've got those kids who got, you know, your outliers. One got the lowest, lowest, another one got the highest, highest. So we don't want the range to be too big. Then it's not going to give us a, a good indication of our marks in that case. But in this case, we're talking attendance. So afternoon group as well, that's the, the, the second reason you can give, that uh, the afternoon group has a higher median. If the median is higher, it means the attendance was good. In terms of marks, if the median of your class is 60 and the median of the other class is 40, it means your class did well. Half of you guys got 60 and above and half of you got 60 and below. So it gives you a good indication of which class performed better. So you can just remember it like that. Again, we can compare our interquartile range. We want it to also be smaller, not bigger. So the range, interquartile range, smaller, median, bigger. Minimum, it has to be bigger as well if you're comparing the minimum. So any of these um, numbers you can use, your, your, your quartiles, 
your range and your minimum and maximum, you can use them to compare why you're saying a group has done well. Right, I hope it makes sense. This is one of the most interesting questions that I like uh, to, to, to do with my learners. Just it gives you an indication of how, how you can be comparing two classes. Maybe you just want to see which class is better. Then you will know, ah, we are doing better than uh, the other class just by comparing your quartiles and your medians. Okay, right. Now we're going to take another short break when we come back we're going to look at possible questions on question four and or question five see you right after this short break welcome back and let us get right into the questions i hope you enjoyed your break there let us see what else we can expect in the paper Question four, level one to four as well, except that here you will find more difficult questions, but not necessarily everything. You will still get your other levels as well. So it says there that a, a grade 12 mathematical literacy class was taught how to use the BMI, which is the body mass index, the growth charts, and weight status charts based on BMI in the data handling lesson. Mary and Julie are friends they collected the following data about themselves. Say so that's the age, their BMIs, their heights, and their mass. Uh, use the information above, and then the growth charts in annexure C, and the weight status in table six in annexure D to answer the following questions. Now let us see how growth charts can be incorporated in this section. So you've got your percentiles there from 5%, then you've got your age from 5%, 5th percentile, then you've got your age, you've got your BMI, let's see. Then you've got the status, uh, the weight status, they're telling you if you are in this percentile, this is what you are, healthy, underweight, and so on. Look at the question, it says determine, find out for us, the interquartile range of the BMI of a 16-year-old girl. So the interquartile range, we all know that the concept IQR is your Q3 minus your Q1. Let's go and see how we can find those uh, quartiles. But just a reminder, we know that Q3 is what? It's our 75th uh, percentage. Usually we say 75% of the data. And Q1 is 25% of the data. Now let's take that percent and say percentile. Let's go find those two values. Yes, so it's 16 years of age. We go up with it. Let's go find first the 75th percentile. So the 75th percentile is here. So when you look on your side, you can see that it's, it's about what? It's 22, more of 22,6. So you will write your 22,6. And then we are going to go to the 25th percentile. Our 25th percentile is just here, which is just below, just below uh, 19, just below. So it, you can say it's 18,9. So you take your calculators and you press 22,6, subtract 18,9. And then you get three comma, get about three comma seven. That is your interquartile range. That is three comma seven. That is your BMI, your interquartile range. Right. So you can associate it with the box and whisker because we know with the box and whisker, twenty five percent, fifty percent. That is your box part, and then there will be your whiskers. That's how we can. Um, just interpret it in another different way. Okay, so let's see what else we can be asked. It says Mary claimed that looking at Jolie's BMI and age, her weight status will be overweight. How will we find that out? Just like we did with now finding the quartiles, we need to go back to our, our chart. But now we are asked to verify using explanation. I'm not going to go deep in this, but I'm just going to show you what we're supposed to be looking at. 
So the Julie's uh, BMI and age, where is Julie? 18 years, BMI 30. We go to the chart. We look 18 years, 18 years, 18 years. We go up with 18 years. Then we come to the right with 30 uh, as your BMI. And then you go where they meet. Where is this point? You can see that it's just under the 95th percentile. It's not the 95th percentile. So you can estimate it to be your 93 percentile. And now that we know that it's 93 percentile, let's go and look at our chart. So 93rd percentile, it's in this range between 85th and 95th. She is at the risk of being overweight. She is not overweight. So Mary's claim was that she is overweight, but we have noticed that uh, it puts her on the 93rd percentile. Uh, and then also it means at risk of, of, of being overweight. So she is at risk of being overweight, not overweight. So it means you go into the, so say that her claim is invalid. She is not overweight yet. She is at risk of being overweight. So that's how you can use your growth charts to find your percentiles and find your IQR. You can be asked to find your quartiles uh, instead of IQR. So be able to, to do that using calculations and also explanations. Moving on, there's a question here that says on, uh, it says one of the ways to compare purchasing power of one country's currency to another country's currency is to compare the local price of common items that are available in all the countries. So the average local price of a Big Mac bagger and a two liter cola, as well as the exchange rates are given in the table four in an extra D. So now we are going to be comparing the buying power uh, of different countries based on one meal, your Big Mac meal and your Big uh, Mac bagger and two liter Coke. Here are the prices in rents on this side, and then these are the, the, the prices in different currencies, in, in, in their own currencies, and here they've given you the exchange rates. Let's see what they are asking us to do. It says that you must identify the country that has the strongest currency in comparison to what? In comparison to rent. Let's see, the one where you have to buy that beggar at a high price. They're talking about beggar, right? Identify the strong currency in rents. So we are given rents in this column. In South Africa, they say it's 50 rents, but now look, the prices are going up and down, but look at this one, 118 rents. So it's clear that this country here has a what? It has the biggest buying power. What is that a country? Is the United Kingdoms. So you need to come back to the graph to read of that United Kingdoms. Now we are asked to calculate the price in rent that you will pay for a two liter cola in the United States of America. I just uh, took a, an enlarged part of the, that image. So we have United States of America here. This is the exchange rate that they've given us. So they're saying one rent or let me use uh, this that they usually use, one uh, ZAR, it equal, it's equals to 0 0.070 US dollars. Now they are asking us to find this two liter. Remember, this is the price of two liter. Let me just take you back to see what I'm talking about. The price of two liter is the first uh, value instead, sorry. Now we are going to take the correct value, not this one that I took. So we have, we now have this one that we need to change. So what I usually do, I will put the, the <coughs> dollar under dollar, rents under rents, so that I make my conversions, conversions proper. 
So this is dollar, is to dollar. Then I don't know how many rands this will be, but I can find that out. One way, cross multiply. Another way, you can use a table. But I usually use this way to say, okay, the side that you have enough information, start with it, you're going up, like you're going anti-clockwise in this case. Ne? When you go up, you divide the two values. The one at the bottom, you say divide by the one at the top. And the answer that you will get, you will multiply it with the one on the other side. So it's as if you're going anti-clockwise. Up, you divide. Down, you multiply. So our question mark will be 1,94 divided by 0, 0,070. Then the answer we will get here, we will say is equals to 1. Usually this method will help you, especially if you're not sure if you're going to be multiplying with the... The, 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 the conversion factor or the exchange rate, or you're supposed to be dividing. Because sometimes it's not easy, like when we are given in one dollar is to 14 rands. In that case, we know when we go to America, the value, what happens, it's as if we're going to be divided, dividing, as we, we are buying the currency at a higher price. When we come in this side, it's a different case. We're going to be appearing as if we have money. Right. Now, we're not going to do uh, this one, all of it, but I just want to show you this part uh, that is very important when it comes to interest. It says there, Miss McKenzie and her family went to Starland to do some stargazing while they were in Sutherland. John, the owner of Starland, bought the property just outside Sutherland as an investment in 2015. He organizes the star gazing tours on his property each evening. Then they say Starland has an, an FNB business account which charges the following fees. Um, here are the fees. Notice this one, they want us to calculate the total cost in bank fees to the business when John deposits 11,300. Deposits, deposit, here is cash deposit, but we are now depositing more than 5,000. So we're going to be using this formula. Just of note, uh, they're saying 1,49, after they say it, uh, rand 40, per 100 or part thereof. So this value here, you will need to divide it by 100, and the amount you're going to multiply it by 1.49. Okay, look at this one. It says the FNB account uh, pays 2,4% interest per annum. The interest is compounded monthly. Compounded monthly, every month it grows, even though they gave it to you per year. Calculate how much interest will John earn on the 11,300 if he cashes out his account in two months. Just some one concept that I want to show you guys is that this interest that you have here you need to make sure that you, you divide it by, by 12 because they're saying compounded monthly. Then you get your, your interest rate there. So don't go multiplying by 2,4, but rather take that 2,4 first and divide it by 12. You will get 0,2%. And when you are doing your calculation for first month, calculation for second month, because they are looking for the interest, remember to take that total value at the end and subtract the value that he had at the beginning uh, of the investment. And then you will get the interest. It's only if they ask you to find the final amount or the total amount, you will end at year number two. But the interest, you need to go further and subtract the two values. Okay. That's what we had time for, uh, great talks. I hope that really uh, helped you a lot with a few concepts that are in our paper one, mathematical literacy. Just some few reminders, relax, believe in yourself, be ready, rest the night before, use the reading time to find which question you are most comfortable with, leave a space when you're answering, don't cluster your things so that if you make a mistake, you can still come and correct. And do not use your correcting fluid. It's not allowed. But all the very best. We know that you're going to make us proud. That's it from me. And goodbye.